As we uh, opened up the day, uh, we acknowledged that we were celebrating 20 years of an extraordinary organization. And um, one should never uh, take for granted what it takes to make a great organization. And so before I introduce our, our keynote speaker for this evening, this afternoon, I'd like to ask all of the former and or current members of the staff of the California Healthcare Foundation and our board and former board members to please stand. If you've ever worked with, been affiliated with, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, California Healthcare Foundation, 20 years of being your partners in doing this great work. Thank you, thank you all of you very, very much. Well, um, as you heard from a number of the breakouts, I hope, uh, one of the things that, of course, we believe is so important in transforming care is to remember the patient's needs at all times. And as we thought about trying to close uh, our session today, um, we really could not think of a better person than um, the physician that I'm about to introduce. Um, I will tell you that, um, you know, many of us are trained as clinicians. Few of us reach the pinnacle both in medicine and in education and in literature. In 2007, Stanford School of Medicine had the wisdom to bring Dr. Abraham Verghese to California from Texas to make him vice chair for the theory and practice of medicine. As a professor of medicine and a practicing clinician in internal medicine, infectious disease, and pulmonary disease, Dr. Verghese has been teaching hundreds of future doctors that it is the utmost importance to adhere to the rituals that help clinicians discover more about their patients and that they should emphasize empathy in their care at all times. Dr. Verghese advocates for a health care system that doesn't let computers and electronic health records take, down, take physicians down the wrong track. He envisions a healthcare system that knows the subtle differences between healing and curing. In his work to transform the patient-physician relationship, Dr. Verghese focuses on clinical skills and the importance of what is conveyed by physicians' presence and their technique at the bedside. He's interested in medical error resulting from oversights in the bedside exam. His work has led to the development of Stanford 25, an innovative program within the medical school that promotes the culture of bedside medicine. The goal is to help physicians avoid missing diagnoses, which lead to delays in care, not because the answer was hard to find, but because it wasn't looked for effectively. His goal is to ensure that the notes go into the electronic chart are accurate and not a form of fiction. But don't let me leave you with the impression that Dr. Verghese doesn't appreciate great fiction. In fact, his critically acclaimed 2009 novel, Cutting for Stone, which I read from front to cover on my uh, sabbatical and have read everything since, remained on the New York Times bestseller list for two years. He's also written two memoirs, one about his work as a young doctor caring for AIDS patients in rural Tennessee when the epidemic was new, and the other about his friendship with a medical resident trying to stay healthy after quelling his addiction to drugs. Dr. Verghese was the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the National Humanities Medal presented to him last year by President Obama. He also won the Heinz Award in Humanities. At this surprising and tumultuous moment in the world of healthcare and health policy, we are eager to hear from Dr. Verghese his thoughts on empathy, healing, and truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, it's a real honor for me to speak to this organization. I, I think I, there are very few organizations in this time in our lives, in our history, that you feel really speak to the right causes. In fact, I was just thinking uh, the threefold mission of this organization. If that was just the mission of Congress, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> We'd all be in the right place, wouldn't we? So it's a real privilege to be here and to, to be rejuvenated and to be, to be refreshed by, by meeting people whose hearts are in the same place, I think, uh, as mine. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I must say that um, I agree with the sense that the ship is off course, and if anyone can bring us back on course, it's the people here in this room. And I'm really privileged to, to feel that I'm part of that, so thank you very much. This title, Telling the Story of What Matters to Patients, I must tell you candidly, was Sandra's title. And uh, she's a very charismatic lady, and so when she speaks, we all listen. And so I promised that I would talk to that title, and I wanted to take it very seriously. So I'm going to begin with a story, uh, not one of mine, but uh, one that I hope you'll, you'll recognize and like. It's about this gentleman, and I should point out that story is elemental to everything we do. When we see patients, we get a history, and what is a history? It even has the word story embedded within it. So this story that I want to tell you has to do with uh, this gentleman, and uh, forgive me, this is the pedagogue in me. I have to check that the back of the room is alive and awake and has a pulse. So I'm going to ask you, who is this gentleman who in his time was the most famous physician in the world? Don't all speak at once. You'll blow me away. <laughs> I heard Chekhov. So this is, in fact, Chekhov. So you all studied Chekhov. And you know there's no particular reason for you no particular reason for you to have known what he looked like. And if I recall reading Chekhov, there was never a picture of him uh, in anything we read. So, but with my medical students, I always have to say not to be confused with, with this Chekhov. <laughs> a very different beast altogether. Um, you know, Chekhov, as you, as you well know, was uh, both a physician and a writer. And he said very famously that uh, medicine was his lawful wedded wife and and uh, writing uh, was, his, was his mistress. Uh, and he left us a lot of aphorisms in writing that uh, we still trot out. He said that if you mention a gun in Act 1, you better use it in Act 3. A lot of lovely pearls like that, which, uh, which I always thought was, was wonderful. Um, he was a practicing physician. He practiced medicine. And he was also a wonderful playwright. And I always wonder, I'm sure you do, how much more might he have added to the canon of his works had he lived another 30, 40 years, which was his due? Uh, but he died of tuberculosis. He died of a very eminently treatable disease. And uh, he died young. And just before he died, in the year before he died, he married Olga Knipper, a stage actress. And she knew he was dying. He knew he was dying. And they decided to get married anyway. Uh, and this is the, the book that captures some of their correspondence. And so I had to tell you all this in order to tell you the story. The story is an excerpt from uh, Troyat's biography of Chekhov, and it describes Chekhov's last moments. So Chekhov, in the last part of his life, suddenly got the harebrained notion that he wanted to go to the Black Forest of Germany. And since he was dying, Olga was not about to deny him anything, so took him on the train, and they went to the Black Forest, and they arrived at a fancy spa called the Badenweiler Spa. And when he first got there, it seemed to be a magical thing to have done, because he perked up, he was no longer coughing up blood, and uh, he wrote home to say he was feeling so energetic. And then, uh, after a week there, one night, all hell broke loose. He began to have massive hemoptysis, coughing up vast amounts of, of blood which is a terrifying symptom for both patient and physician, because not only is the patient losing blood, they're compromising their airway as they're doing so. And so they sent for the spa physician, a man by the name of Dr. Schwerer. And Dr. Schwerer is summoned, 
And this is all you had to know for me to recite the passage for you. Are you ready? Have I, have I set it up enough? Okay, so here goes. The windows were wide open, but Chekhov could not stop panting. His temples were bathed in sweat. Dr. Schwer arrived at two o'clock, and Chekhov, in a final reflex of courtesy, sat back against the pillows and mastered his weak German to say, Ich sterbe, I am dying. Dr. Schwer administered a camphor injection, but Chekhov's heart failed to react. Dr. Schwer was about to send for an oxygen pillow when Chekhov, lucid to the end, said, What's the use, doctor? Before it comes, I will be a corpse. And so Dr. Schwer sent for a bottle of champagne. When it came, Chekhov turned to Olga, his wife, and said, it's been so long since I've had champagne. He raised the glass, he drained it, he lay down, he turned over to his left side, he stopped breathing. He had passed from life to death with characteristic simplicity. It was July the 2nd, 1904, three o'clock in the morning. A large black-winged moth had flown in through the window and was beating wildly against the lamp. The sound was very distracting. Dr. Schwer withdrew after a few words of consolation. All at once, there was a joyous explosion. The cork popped out of the champagne bottle. The moth found its way out through the window into the sultry night. Silence returned at last. When dawn broke, Olga was still sitting there staring at her husband's face. She would say his expression was peaceful, smiling, knowing. She would write later, there were no everyday sounds, there were no human voices, there was only beauty, peace, and the grandeur of death. I don't know about you, but I've always loved that passage at, at many different levels. Uh, I've loved it because it's about one of my heroes, but I've also loved it because I identify with Dr. Schwer. Um, you know, I've had the privilege, as many of you in this room have had, or the misfortune of taking care of physicians who are dying, uh, especially in the AIDS era, and the, they were, many of them were my age. And it was a very difficult thing because on the one hand you were drawn to them, you know, fallen soldiers on the battlefield, but on the other hand, by definition, you had a very difficult patient on your hands. And so here's Dr. Schwerer, who's retired to the Badenweiler Spa, the best gig you could probably get. And the worst thing you'll see is an ankle sprain and a you know, poison ivy, perhaps. And here he is called at 2 in the morning to see the most famous physician in the world who's, who's dying. And he comes in and he quickly does his medical assessment and camphor. And, but then he switches gears and he orders the bottle of champagne. And to me, that's a, just an incredible choice that he makes. And it seems to set in motion, at least in the telling of the story, it seems to set in motion everything that follows. He orders the champagne, Chekhov has, Chekhov has a glass, he leans over to his left side, he stops breathing, the moth escapes out of the window, the champagne cork pops out of the bottle, at least in the telling. The function of Dr. Schwerer is not as dramatic as the many things people associate with medicine, but I would say it's just as important. It's just as vital. So I want to take you back a little bit in time and just point out to you, since I know many of you are evidence-based mavens and uh, you know this foundation is all about measurements and quality, which I'm all for, I should say, although I have no head for math. I'm not good at these things. In fact, I've just been invited in a few weeks to to give the commencement address at McMaster, you know, the, the, the bastion of evidence-based medicine. And I actually called them up and I said, are you sure you have the right person? Because <laughs> this has not been my, my strength. But the point being that our ability to make diagnoses, to measure, I think is very recent. I would date it to this time. I think this is the watershed moment. See, 1819, no matter what ailed you, you went to see a barber surgeon the barber surgeon cupped you, bled you, you know, cut your hair long at the sides, short at the back, pulled a tooth, but made no attempt at diagnosis. But at this moment in time, Joseph Leopold Omberger, the son of an innkeeper, invented 
the technique of percussion, which was in a way the ultrasound of its day. The story is that his father was an innkeeper and he had seen his father strike on the sides of the cast of wine to decide when to reorder. And so Ornberger, when he became a physician, began to tap on patients. And everything we know about percussion was described by Ornberger in this book, Inventum Novum. There's only two things that he didn't describe, which we call chronexismus and scodaic resonance and a few other things, but really it was all there. And for the first time you could detect fluid in the lung, consolidation of the lung, enlargement of the heart, enlargement of organs. It was a marvel because till then you couldn't tell any of these things in life. And very shortly after that, um, a student of Corvisart in France, Lenach, developed auscultation. Now, people had been listening to patients' bodies before. In fact, Hippocrates listened to the body and described the succussion splash of hydropneumothorax, which you can still hear today if you're interested. You, 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 if you tap a pleural effusion in some air gets in there, which it often does, and you then put your stethoscope on the patient as they lie on their side and shake them, you can hear a nice splash. It's, uh, if you want to win some points with your medical students, you can show this to them. Lenach discovered the stethoscope and very shortly thereafter was discovered the reflexes and the reflex hammer came with that, the ophthalmoscope, the blood pressure cuff, the thermometer, and all of a sudden clinical excellence at the bedside, the ability to diagnose things in life became extant when before there was nothing there. It was really a remarkable time. And just to tell you how remarkable, uh, I love to tell the story about uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who you know wrote the Sherlock Holmes series of books. And Conan Doyle was a, was a physician in Edinburgh. He was a medical student at Edinburgh. And he described the fact that he based his character, Sherlock Holmes, on his physician, uh, Joseph Bell. Joseph Bell was an extraordinary clinician, but probably not that different from the kinds of clinicians who then existed at both, on both sides of the Atlantic. And Conan Doyle, writing in the Lancet uh, many years later, described what it was like to be a student of Joseph Bell's. And he talked about how Bell would be seated in the outpatient department with you know, a horde of students around him, which, by the way, was the model uh, with which I learned, both in Africa and in India, where I trained. Uh, and a patient, a, a woman with a child walked in. And this is the dialogue they had. The woman said, good morning. And Bell says, good morning, and what sort of crossing did you have on the ferry from Burnt Island? She's astonished, she says, it was a good crossing. He says, and what did you do with the other child? She says, well, I left the other child with my sister in Leith. And he says, and uh, did you take the shortcut down Inverleith Road to get here this morning? And she says, yes, I did. And he says, and would you still be working at the linoleum factory in Fife? And she says, yes, I am. And then he goes on to explain to the students. He says, you see, when she said good morning, I picked up her Fife accent. And the nearest crossing from Fife to Edinburgh is the, is the ferry at Burnt Island. Secondly, the coat she's carrying is too small for the child who's with her. And therefore, she began this journey with two children and dropped one off along the way. Thirdly, the mud, that red clay on the soles of her shoes, is of a variety not to be found within 100 miles of Edinburgh, except in the botanical gardens. And Inverleith Row is her shortcut to the infirmary. The infirmary no longer exists, but Inverleith Row and the botanical gardens very much there. And finally, the dermatitis on the fingers of her right hand is of a kind only to be found in the linoleum factory workers of Burnt Island. I don't know about you, but uh, I love the story. My students love the story. That's really why they came to medicine, is for that, kind of, for that kind of skill, amongst other things. And I don't think we do a very good job of delivering it to them. So I like this series of pictures because it captures another one of my heroes. I promise to tell stories. So these are a succession of stories. But there is a, a linking theme if you, if you. Sandra's in despair back there, but I am, I am connecting this, OK? <laughs> No, you're not in despair? OK. These are a famous series of pictures of Osler from the McGill collection. Osler at the bedside inspecting, Osler palpating and percussing, Osler auscultating, 
And then Osler doing something I don't think we do often enough. Osler contemplating. And I love this image of the five because to me this echoes this image, which is the most famous iconic painting in medicine. I'm sure most of you know this. If you don't, I'm really happy to tell you a little bit about it. This is The Doctor by Luke Fields. It was painted at a time in art when people were just beginning to take on themes of social importance. And Fields, that's spelled F-I-L-D-E-S, was challenged by Tate, who then went on to build the Tate Gallery. He was a sugar baron. He was the, the Bill Gates of his time, if you like. Challenged him to paint a painting of social importance. And Fields decided he would try and record the doctor in our time. And he was moved to do this because his son Philip, age nine, had died on Christmas Eve. And a doctor had held vigil for two days and nights, and uh, he wanted to pay tribute to that person. So if I can just walk you through this, um, you can see that the, the painting is dominated by this sick child in the center. And there's something about the posture of the child's arm, hand, that really suggests this is a moribund child sleeping on two dining room chairs brought together. So this is a child who at other times is on a, on a straw pallet in the back of this cabin, fisherman's cabin, perhaps. And then you have the parents on one side, the mother praying and the father looking at the doctor. And then on this side of the space, you have the doctor. And interestingly, even though this is the era of the blood pressure cup, the, the thermometer, the reflex hammer, the, the, the stethoscope, None of these things are in the picture. Contrast this with the famous American painting of that era, the Gross Clinic, which shows the surgeon Samuel Gross, you know, in an amphitheater, blood on his apron and, uh, you know, holding forth. That is the sort of picture you would expect. But Fields deliberately chose to leave all those trappings out. I think it's because he didn't want to distract us from the singular attentiveness of that physician to the patient. And this painting was enormously popular. It was mobbed when it was first displayed. They had to keep the crowd away. I mean, this is before Netflix and Amazon and all that. So, you know, nevertheless, it, was, it struck a chord. It made its way to postage stamps in 20-something countries. In Britain, it was used to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the National Health Service. In America, it had an infamous use. It was used for the first successful smear campaign run by none other than the American Medical Association. This will interest you. When President Truman wanted to introduce socialized medicine, the AMA printed 60,000 copies of this painting as a poster, put it in doctors' offices with this logo. If this is going to give you ideas about something we might do in this current era, it's not a bad idea. As Morris Fishbein was behind this, it was extraordinarily successful. They torpedoed socialized medicine. and. Uh, this was the first successful smear campaign. Lots of debate as to what does this painting mean? What is it about? What does it tell us? And my sense is that this painting, despite the title, The Doctor, I don't think this is about the doctor. I think this painting is about you and I, the viewer, projecting ourselves into this place and thinking if we're the patient, this is the kind of singular attentiveness we want from the people caring for us. That's, I think, why this painting resonates. I think it brings to mind uh, the sentiments that are expressed in almost any religious text you care to mention. In the Bible, in Matthew, it says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was ill and you cared for me. Uh, I think it speaks to what uh, Loeb of, uh, of, I think it was Cornell or Columbia, of, of the Cecil and Loeb textbook, he called the Samaritan function of being a physician. Or what Tinsley Harrison in his famous address on the three roots of medicine, he talked about the scientific root, he talked about the, um, you know, the experimental root, the, the caring bedside skill root, but then the third root was the priestly function of being the physician. I think this painting echoes that, that quality that we've become a bit coy about talking about. Patients, I, I would argue, still strongly feel it. So I've often wondered what would this look like if Fields were challenged to paint the same painting, the doctor in our time, in the year 2017. And 
My great fear is that it would look like this, because clearly we have shifted our attention. Now, this is what rounds used to look like. Uh, this is Boston City Hospital, actually where I trained, but a few decades later. This is a who's who of American medicine around the bed. That's uh, Morton Schwartz in infectious disease, Jack Remington from Stanford. If you uh, have done MICs or any of these things, they all began with Max Finland, a very unusual character. Lived in the hospital, never married, was mugged in the basement many a time, ate in the cafeteria. And this is, for those of you who like data, this will please you greatly because all that's being discussed here is data. The human being for whom the data, to whom the data connects is simply not in the picture. And I want to make the case in the, in the short time that I have that we need to find a better way to wed these two. It can't be all one, nor can it be all the other. But the consequences of it being all this, which is where we're headed, is disastrous, I think. And so I won't speak to all of these, but I want to speak to two of these in particular. The consequences of this switch, if we don't learn to blend it better, are patient dissatisfaction. I think it's the thing that Sandra had me really want to, wanted me to focus on. And that won't be hard. I think you all can echo that. Our wellness as people who care for patients is very much fun uh, a function of this. I'll explain why. Medical error, I won't talk too much about, but I will say a little bit about ritual. But let me begin with patient dissatisfaction. So clearly, when our attention is on the screen and not on them, even if we're very good at sort of blending the two, patients don't really particularly like it. Uh, there have been studies on eye contact by people who do this sort of thing to show that you know when you are looking at the patient, they're looking at you, there's a certain exchange going on there. The moment you turn to the computer, they also turn to the computer and then they drop their eyes, which in the language of people who follow eye movements is a sign of dejection. It's consequential. On a date, you'd never do this, right? On a date, you wouldn't interrupt the date to, well, you might, but... <laughs> It wouldn't, it wouldn't go very far. So I thought rather than trying to you know, give you an example from this era in computers, I'd give you an example that's timeless. I think it's a poignant statement of what patients want. And it comes before the current era. It's by Anatole Broyard, a very complex man, a critic for the New York Times Book Review, who died of prostate cancer. We use his book a lot in, in our teachings. And, uh, the book is called Intoxicated by My Illness. He's had, he had this to say about his doctor. He said, my doctor knows all there is there's to know about the prostate, but I cannot sit down and have a talk with him about it. I find that a very great deprivation. What a curious organ. What can God have been thinking when he designed it this way? I would love to have a meditation, a rumination, a lucubration, a bombination about the prostate, but I can't. I'm forced to stop people on the street and talk to them about it. And then he says what I think is the heart of what I want to get across. I just wish my doctor would brood on my situation for perhaps five minutes, that he would give me his whole mind just once, be bonded with me for a brief space, survey my soul as well as my flesh to get at my illness, for each man is ill in his own way. I would echo that. Each man and woman is ill in his or her own way. And especially... If it's a serious illness, there is a great need for the kind of recognition he's talking about. And as long as we're focused on the numbers to the exclusion of the patient, we don't do a good job of satisfying this impulse. I'm not going to say too much about physician wellness, except to say that uh, any of you, and I've been listening to all of you who are big leaders of healthcare in your institutions, this is a huge concern. 50% of primary care physicians, we're told, are unhappy our own survey four years ago showed a level of burnout that shocked us, and we took all kinds of major action, repeated the survey four years later, it's worse. And let me tell you, if this is not on your horizon, it should be. Physicians who score high on a burnout scale have a 21% chance of leaving in three years. Think of all the investment you made to bring them there, and then if you don't do something about this, and why are they unhappy? In a nutshell, it's a 4,000 click a day problem. So for those of you who are great fans of Lean and Six Sigma, more power to you. But every time you add another keystroke on the backs of physicians who are already breaking, uh, you are 
going to increase the chances of losing them. So it's all coming from the medical, electronic medical record in its present form. In its present form, we are the highest paid clerical workers in the hospital, as Bob Wachter says, you know, and um, it's got to change. Something better has to come along. The, the, the present electronic medical record is the root of the unhappiness. The time we spend on this for every one hour of patient care, two hours on the computer, and another hour at night. This is untenable. You know, uh, it's a mistake. The computer is the, the one that we're using now that mixes billing and patient care. It's a mistake of epic proportions. I won't say anything more about that. <laughs> I also won't say anything about medical error because we really don't have the time for it, but not surprisingly, if we're distracted, and I'm very much in this category, it's not surprising that things escape us. I commissioned this cartoon that says, as you can see, a man's been run through by the Titanic, and the caption says, let's get a CAT scan, consult the gastroenterologist, and figure out why you're having these pains. What I really want to get to, I think, is at the heart of what this wonderful organization champions, directly or indirectly, and that is, the wonderful <clears throat> ritual of being with a patient and the, the importance of that ritual. I must say, I didn't fully understand this uh, until I got to Stanford and had a chance to talk with my anthropology colleagues about an experience I'd had with my chronic fatigue patients. Um, in Texas, before I moved here, I had a reputation as being interested in chronic fatigue. Now, this is not something you would wish on your worst enemy. I don't quite know <laughs> how it happened. These are difficult patients. They, they, they come ready to you know, have you join the ranks of people who've disappointed them. And so I had this method I'd hit on where I let them tell me their story in the first visit and separated the physical for a second visit because I could not do it all in one visit. I just couldn't do it. And in my second visit, the first or second patient in this series, despite our understanding, kept wanting to tell me more history in the second visit. And I remember I was almost in despair, and I decided to just launch into my exam. And we all have our ways of beginning the exam. I, I actually think, though, even though we record it as head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, it's kind of unseemly to just grab somebody's head <laughs> as your opening gambit in an exam. So I think it's very good to begin with a handshake, the most natural gesture. So I took the patient's hand, and I'm registering all the things we register, you know, Cyanosis, clubbing, dupatrins, myotonia, warmth, moistness. And my left hand comes around to feel the pulse, and I'm feeling the rate, rhythm, volume, character of the vessel wall. And then my hand slides to the epitrochlear lymph node, and I am now in my ritual, which hasn't changed one bit in 30-something years. It's become more abbreviated, I, I would suppose, less than the medical students do. But an interesting thing happened. This voluble patient began to quiet down. And I had an eerie sense that the patient and I had slipped into a kind of a dance in which I had a role and the patient had a role. And when I was done, the patient said with some awe, I've never been examined like this before. Which, if it were true, is a real condemnation of our healthcare system because all I did was a fairly abbreviated exam. And then I told the patient exactly what they'd heard in Scott and White or Mayo, wherever they'd been, you know, this is not in your head, this is real but it's not coxie, it's not TB. And I always thought that if the patient accepted this and bonded with me and began a partnership with me, it was something had happened in this ritual. And when I got to Stanford, I told my colleagues in anthropology the story, and they stopped me and they said, Abraham, you're describing a ritual. And they taught me that rituals are all about transformation. We engage in rituals like today's to the 20th anniversary, to, to signal the crossing of a threshold, baptisms, bar mitzvahs, take marriage. We marry with considerable pomp, ceremony, huge expense to signal our departure from a life of loneliness, misery, solitude to one of eternal bliss. I'm not sure why you're laughing. I'm glad your spouses are not here too. Well, I would submit to you that the ritual of any one of us, of an individual going to another, and telling them things they would not tell their preacher or rabbi, and my specialty, telling them things they would never tell their spouse. And then all of this happening in a room whose furniture doesn't look like the furniture in your house or mine, and one person's wearing a white ceremonial 
shamanistic outfit with tools in their pocket, the other one's wearing a ceremonial paper outfit that no one knows how to tie or untie. And then, incredibly, one, one person in this dyad disrobes and allows touch, which in any other context in our society is assault. The current political season should not confuse you about this. It is assault. Tell me this is not an important ritual. And uh, having been in California now 10 years, I, I, I marvel at the number of different ethnic groups I've taken care of. Hmong, Laotians, you name it, people I've never seen before. They all have completely different beliefs about health care, disease. But they all believe that if you put them in this room and you presume to enact what seems like a ritual, all the trappings of ritual, they're onto you if you don't do it well. If you just go in there and do a half-assed prod of their belly and stick your stethoscope on the paper gown, they're onto you. Just as you're onto the sloppy chef, the sloppy hairdresser, the sloppy mechanic, the, the sloppy anybody. You have a good eye, and so do your patients. So it made me sort of come back to the sense that ritual is important. We have to teach it. Thank you, Sandra, for mentioning the Stanford 25, which is really our attempt to teach it. As Osler said, people judge us by the least things we do to them. They don't judge us by the diplomas on our wall. They judge us by the nicety of the least maneuver that we do. So we try to pass on these skills. I've gotten very interested in trying to sort of capture that word precision, which is all over the place these days. I think we need great precision in population science. We do need great precision in individual biology. But by God, we also need great precision in understanding the human experience of illness. And we simply haven't brought everything to bear to study that. And to that end, we've begun a new center at Stanford that we call Presence, the Art and Science of Human Connection, because I think this is truly what it's all about. At least for me, it's what it's all about. I want to close by saying to you that um, as you correct the course of this ship, as you steer us back from these uh, uh, treacherous waters, uh, please keep in mind that it's very much a human endeavor. Uh, we would never presume to take care of an infant using robots, even though you, know, you can buy diapers that will you know, signal your iPhone when the diaper is wet. And you know, if we can take out a gallbladder, by God, we can change a baby's diaper with a robot. We'd never presume to do that. We recognize that infants need our love and our nurturing. The very ill patient, especially the very ill patient, needs that from us too. And this will always be a human-to-human -human profession. And hopefully all the advances in AI, which I celebrate, will free us up to be more in the priestly Samaritan function that Loeb spoke about, that Tinsley Harrison spoke about. Because as Peabody said 100 years ago, and I think this is timeless, the secret of the care of the patient, in addition to good data, in addition to metrics, in addition to standardization, and all the things we all believe in, is caring for the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions, Sandra, and you'll signal me when, when it's time to stop. Uh, they're coming around with microphones, so there's a gentleman up here. If you need to leave, you won't hurt my feelings. I know how traffic is and so on. So, Thank you very much. That was Thank you. awesome. Uh, I would like to get your opinions on telemedicine and the application of telemedicine vis-a-vis -vis the ritual that you're talking about. Yeah, I'm all for it. I mean, I, I worry sometimes when I give these talks that people view me as a Luddite. And, you know, you'll be happy to know I embrace technology. I actually carry an ultrasound in my pocket. I'm, I'm, I'm learning to use it better every year. Uh, and I think that anything that works, I'm all for it. So we actually have a, a digital primary care clinic at Stanford where we, we meaning I'm, I'm not personally in any way responsible for it, I'm just taking pride in it, where we offer patients the, the combination of being able to come in person or connect with us by video, by phone. And it's very interesting. The young patients are the ones who want to come see us. The older patients are like, they know what they need. And they don't want to come schlep there, get the parking ticket, wait while you're two hours behind schedule and just to get their refill. They'll come if they need to. 
So I'm all for it. I think anything that uh, helps us. I just, I'm, I'm just tired of this notion that's what's going to save us is the next app. Or the notion from administration that we've got unhappy physicians. If only we have another little course on, you know, on staying in the moment uh, as though that's going to solve our problem. You know, we'll stay in the moment all we can, but help us out with this unseemly burden of electronic medical records. So I'm all for it. Thank you for that. Um, Matthew yes. Holt. I'm from Health 2.0, so you'd expect me to object a little bit. Um, I have a bigger objection I'll get to at the end of my question. Can you but, speak a little bit sorry, your accent? Sorry, I will, I will slow down. The, my object... What do you say? Oh, sorry, I had to speak American now? All right. No, my, uh, <laughs> no I like your... Uh, is it Scottish? No, no, what fine. is it? Uh, so the, my question is, do you believe that you are a futurist? And I think, I think you are in that the return of empathy, time with patients, uh, really understanding that human connection is, I think, something we would all celebrate that has been lost. You're blaming it on the EMR, but I would blame it on circumstances over history, and it may not have been there as much as you, as you believe. Do you think that will return with increased technology? And more importantly, do you think that that will be the role of a physician or will it be distributed amongst a whole variety of players who don't really exist now? And my second question is, have you ever changed a diaper in your life? Because I do not believe you about this, not <laughs> wanting a robot. I have two kids. I've just changed. I've just got my second one potty trained. If there had been a robot, I would have hired him five years ago. <laughs> so I'll take your second question first. I've had three boys, and by God, I did change their diaper. So <laughs> I got pretty good at it. Didn't make it any better. It's not, you know, it's just one of those things you got to do, right? Um, to come back to your first question, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I recognize that my blaming the, me the electronic medical record is, it's not the only thing that's happened. The, the other big bear in the room, which I don't need to talk to you about, is reimbursement. Reimbursement shapes everything we do. Uh, my, my mother just passed away a few months ago, but my father's 93. If I want his aortic valve replaced, I have to fend off all the thoracic surgeons who want to line up and do it. If I want to find someone, a geriatrician, or just a good primary care doctor, spend 40 minutes, which is what he needs, you know, God help me, I can't find that in the Bay Area. Not easily. I see my esteemed colleagues here, I know. I hate to burden you with, with my dad, believe me. He'll take 50 minutes, not 45. But my point is that we don't pay for that. I ask my medical students, when is the last time you drove by a you know, a fancy, you know, geriatric freestanding center that had valet parking and a spiral staircase and a piano that plays in the lobby and, you know, concierge. It, you know, where's our money going? It's going in the wrong place. So it's not just electronic medical record. It's a number of things. But I would say that, you know, physicians are infinitely adaptable, willing. I just love what you had to say about, you know, no matter what comes your way to San Francisco General, you're committed to caring for them, and I think that's, for the most part, our attitude. However, we, we do have a breaking point, and I think the electronic medical rep record to us represents something silly that could be fixed. You know, we're right now the highest paid clerical workers in the hospital, and we need something better, you know? The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. The Stone Age ended because we came up with a new technology, so I actually embrace technology. I think technology will liberate us. You know, why not capture what really happened in the encounter rather than having us create this fiction of cut and paste where no one knows what the hell happened. If you really want to say you're saying something new, you have to boldface your notes. How terrible is that? You know, morasses of data that are meaningless. And if you really want to say something new, at the end of your four pages of paste, you boldface it. You know, that's just not how we should be doing it. So um, Andy Gies from Health Tech Capital. You know, I come from Europe there where the way we treat patients, especially in the last six or 12 months of life, is very different than in the US, where the doctors come to your home and they take all the steps to have what I call a, a very beautiful ending. Where here, you know, we do the opposite. We have to try all the latest technology. What's the role of the doctor in changing that? Well, um, that's a good question. I, you know, I think 
I'm not the expert on that. I think clearly this is a live wire topic in America. You know, you can't talk about rationing care at the end of life. And, but I think we're making inroads. Uh, you know, the wonderful documentary that, uh, that I think this organization is putting forward and efforts like that I think are terribly important to bring that end of life discussion to the forefront. Um, Atul Gawande's lovely book, uh, you know, it is happening. It's happening slower than we like. Um, I must say that I think, you know, when we rail about costs and expenses, for the longest time, organizations that represented us went to Congress and they, they didn't represent the, the good of medicine. They represented the moneyed interests. And they still are doing that, I think, honestly. Uh, and so now when they go and rattle the cage of Congress, not everybody's listening because we've been historically so keen to defend our turf and our billing and, you know, year after year, primary care folks need more payment. But I think they get outvoted by the super specialists who have bigger lobbies and bigger budgets and, you know, shoot them down. So uh, end of life is just one in a series of things that we need to fix. But I'm, but I'm a real optimist. I do think that, uh, you know, the bar is, is, is moving. I think keeping that optimistic perspective in these difficult times is, uh, is terribly important. I heard the story just the last two days. I must share with you while the microphone finds its next place about, you know, different kinds of views. So one person sees no light at the end of the tunnel. Another person sees light at the end of the tunnel, optimists and pessimists. Then there's the realist who sees light at the end of the tunnel and realizes it's a train coming to them. <laughs> and then there's the engine driver who has another perspective. He sees three idiots standing on the track. <laughs> So it's all about the perspective we choose to adopt. So let's adopt one that serves us, which is that I think things are getting changed. Yes. Yes. I'm Sergio Aguilar Gaxiola from UC Davis. As a scholar of the study of medicine, or the history of medicine, rather, uh, this emphasis or focus on the human touch uh, of caring for uh, patients, uh, is that a cyclical thing, you know, that uh, comes into vogue from time to time? Huh. And, and if that is the case, you know, where are we right now? Yeah, great question. I also realized that I didn't address the tail end of your previous question about, you know, extenders, care extenders. And, uh, you know, in the HIV era, frankly, we couldn't have managed without all the care extenders. So I'm actually the biggest fan of PAs, nurse practitioners, and you know, all the folks who work with us. I worked as an orderly for a year and a half uh, in America while I was trying to figure out my way from civil war in Africa back into a medical school. And I've always had the greatest appreciation for the folks on the front line, uh, the people who are with the patient 23 hours and 55 minutes while the rest of us not, you know, breeze in and out. Is it cyclical? I don't know. I think that I do feel like you know, the stuff I talk about makes people uncomfortable. And, you know, why have we really come so far from caring that, you know, the idea of nurturing a patient makes you uncomfortable and only data makes you comfortable? But, uh, you know, I take great faith in the medical students who we're seeing as they come in. They have a wonderful heart for the practice of medicine. Something happens to them, unfortunately, when they go from their preclinical to their clinical years or as I call it, from their pre-cynical to their cynical years. <laughs> and it has to do with us. They come and see our systems, and they come and see the fact that you know, we teach them all the stuff, percussion, auscultation, and then they go into the hospital, and it's all the currency revolves around the computer. So you can't blame them. So I don't know if it's cyclical. I, I don't know the answer to that. But thank you for that question. Yes, hello. I'm Annette Gardner, UCSF, and I wanted to pick up on Matthew's question. I'm so glad you came back around to it about who else is in the room. And because um, I'm wondering if we're on a, potentially on the cusp of a little bit of a paradigm change around you know, who's in the room and how do they work together, particularly with the team-based approach to care, which we're seeing at the VA and with the patient-centered medical home, which in some ways it's a little more than extending. It's a lot more about sharing the care watching each other's back, continuity, warm handoff, and a more shared understanding of what each profession brings to the room and how do you have that cross-learning across the silos, which we think might be breaking down. Could you comment on that? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. I mean, I, I, I think it's the best thing that could happen. I think sometimes when we regiment it too much, we're in danger of, you know, making it lose some of its charm. But I, you know, I'm all for it. I think that's the only way to do it, especially, you know, the clinics that are successful. My colleague Arnie Milstein, uh, many of his folks are here today. They study successful clinics, and that's one of the keys. They really have very efficient teams working together and, uh, you know, picking up after each other. So I'm all for it. I don't see any contradiction. Everything I've said, I think, applies to every member of the team equally. Uh, we all have different skills, but I, I, I think that there's no contradiction there. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, can you help me thank our speaker for this afternoon? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite all of you to go downstairs and help us uh, with a little reception uh, to celebrate everybody in the room, everyone that's done this incredible work, and help us get the inspiration to continue to make California do the things that we know it can do to make healthcare work for everybody. Thank you all for coming. Join us. <laughs>